Colombia. We're going to hear, so the title of the talk was uh, slightly changed from the schedule, I think. Uh, you can uh, see it for yourself. Uh, at least uh, some, of, some of this work uh, presented uh, here received the best paper award in, uh, best student paper award it called. In, uh, the, the, the student uh, presenting it was Juan Wang, who's now joining uh, Yahoo soon, and Dan in Yale, and other collaborators that I'm sure we're going to say, and that's it. I mean, okay. All right, great. So thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to be here today. Um, so what I'd like to do today is tell you about some of our recent work on modeling and analysis of visual data. So my collaborators and I are interested in, um, in data sets and in problems that come from applications in imaging and vision. So questions like, how we can compute with large sets of images, large sets of videos, um, how we can solve practical problems like recognition, um, denoising, classification. And you know, it's pretty clear, um, in some sense, we're, we're here to talk about concise or succinct data representations. It's pretty clear to have, that to have any hope in problems that where we're dealing with you know, observations in millions of dimensions or billions of dimensions, we're going to need some notion of structure in the data. So we need to know structurally what's going on here in this very large sets of high dimensional data. So our, our problem really is how we can extract some kind of useful low dimensional structure in high dimensional imagery data. And this could be physical structure, it could come from the process that generate the data. It could be geometric structure, so here mixtures of subspaces. It could be some kind of statistical structure. And so we'll actually see all of these notions in, in the talk. But anyway, the question is really how do we capture structure in, um, in imaging pro problems in service of applications? And so what I'd like to do today is I'd like to tell you about um, a couple of results of, that pertain to this problem really um, talking about, in some sense, two methodologies for getting at the structure in high dimensional data. So we'll talk about a kind of classical analytical methodology where we sit down and we think very, very carefully about the process that generated our data. We try to analyze properties of the data set and from that derive good representations. We'll talk a little bit about the kind of statements that we can make in one very specific application. And then in the last part of the talk, we'll transition into some questions about how we can learn good models automatically. So if we don't know as much, or we're in a situation where our structure of interest is more statistical and less physical or geometric, what can we do? So, so this is the, the broad outline of the talk. Um, so I'm going to start the, the beginning of the talk actually very, very, very narrow in some sense. So we'll talk about one very specific application. And then from there, we'll branch out a little bit. So the application that I'm interested in is um, in visual recognition. So the situation is the following. We have an object of interest. Maybe it's a human face. Maybe it's something else. And we would like to know if this object is present in some new input image. So I have some information about the object. You know, Maybe I have a model. Maybe I have some training images. And eventually, I would like to detect or recognize this in a new image. And so there are a lot of very interesting engineering questions that you can ask here. Um, in terms of analysis of high dimensional data, the question is really what we need to do this well. So if we want to have an algorithm that, say, in some sense, guarantees to detect or recognize this object, what do we need to know? What are the resources that are needed, both in terms of computation and in terms of data? OK, so I have the object. I'd like to recognize it in the new image. Now, one of the fun things about working on problems of this nature is that actually the difficulties are, are kind of obvious. You know, you just look around and you see, see what the challenges are. Um, the challenges are that objects move around, lighting conditions change, and objects can occlude each other. So these sort of very simple to state but difficult to compute with um, phenomena, these kind of physical nuisances. So in terms of mathematics for this talk, I'm only going to describe what we need to do for fixed pose, thinking about variations in illumination and perhaps some occlusion. 
Okay, so, so even restrict the problem a little bit more. Ask, what do we really need to know about the data in order to solve the problem? Now, since uh, this is, you know, this is a, an imaging problem, this is largely an engineering field, it's worth talking about popular engineering approaches to the problem. Um, and there are, broadly speaking, two, I would say, two fundamental lines of, of approach on problems like this that really um, depend on what you want from the application. So if you need to be very scalable, if you want to work across the internet, then you know, you're kind of forced to work with very simple image representations. So what people will do is they will try to mitigate these nuisances by making a clever choice of features. So you, make, you choose some nonlinear features, and then you do some kind of a near neighbor or nearest neighbor search. Maybe do some more sophisticated learning on top of that, but the basic idea is to work through the features. And for problems where you really need to be very scalable, this is essentially the best thing that we know. And you know, there's a, there's a lot of work that's been sort of improving this over time. For problems where we really need high recognition rates, or potentially where we want guarantees, um, there's another approach that seems promising in some sense, which is to use the physics of the process that generated the data. And you know, this is. Again, a very old idea. Um, and it's, it's also kind of a, a fun one to play with in the sense that it leaves you with um, representations and algorithms that are actually very simple. So once you cast the problem as one of representing the collection of images that you're going to encounter, then this recognition or verification problem just becomes one of regression against that set. And so people do things like make linear models for the, the set of images that you encounter for example, under varying elimination. And then the kind of um, regression or optimization problem that you would have to solve is just a linear regression. So here I, I write my input as a linear combination of the training database plus some error. And of course, here the error is capturing something physical. It's capturing this occlusion. OK, so basically this, this, this methodology and you know, this is not, of course, not the only work that takes this methodology. This methodology really puts the onus on having a good representation for this high dimensional imagery data. So if we do well with the model, then we really should expect to do well in terms of the application. Now, it is worth mentioning that the computational problems that you encounter, especially when you're trying to compute with errors, so when you want to be robust, um, are fundamentally hard. So for example, if I, I want to correct a sparse error, I want to deal with occlusion, then you know, in the worst case, there may not be too much that I can do. But you know, I think as, as most of us are aware, there are very good relaxations for dealing with these kind of errors, dealing with corruption, corruption corrupted linear regression. And we can make, you know, I think, a, a, at least fairly satisfying statements about the performance of linear regression when the model fits. So what I've put up here is a result with, um, with Yi Ma. Um, this one was motivated by the application, and so the model is maybe not as elegant or homogeneous as the ones that are studied by you know, others in the room. Um, but it, it kind of captures, um, in some sense, what we would expect. And what it says is that if you have a, if you have a linear model, if y is actually equal to ax plus e, x is sparse enough, e is sparse enough, and a satisfies some appropriate property, so a is nice enough in some sense, then you actually can make very nice statements about the performance of L1 regression. So in some sense, the, uh, the bottleneck here, you know, if we want to really take this from making pictures and graphs to really being able to make strong statements about the performance of the algorithm, the bottleneck here is really the modeling question. The question of, you know, when, when does this actually fit? Um, how well does this capture the physics in the data? OK, so it seems that if we want to make progress, we need to understand a little bit more about where our image is, where our, where our problem comes from. OK. So there's a fairly standard model for image formation in computer vision and computer graphics um, that says I have my object here of interest. You know, maybe it's my, my face. And I'm going to imagine, at least for the theorems that I'll show you later, 
that the illumination is distant. So illumination is directional. So I have my lighting, which is a, a function of direction. So you can imagine that this is defined on the sphere in high dimensional, or excuse me, it's defined on the sphere. It's a non-negative function. And we're going to imagine that it's, it's nice in a technical sense. So I have light, that's a function. That bounces off my face, maybe interreflects a little bit, and then impinges on the sensor. And I'm going to tell one lie here, which is I'm going to ignore quantization of the sensor. So I'm going to imagine that we have a linear sensor response. So if that's the case, this process of light transport is linear. And so what we have is we have, in some sense, the image of the lighting condition under a linear map. So if I'm interested in thinking about the collection of lighting conditions that I could encounter, um, you know, if I think about all of the non-negative functions on the sphere, say all of the non-negative functions on the sphere that are nice enough, um, that's actually going to give me a convex cone in the image space. And the reason for this is fairly simple. If I take um, sums or non-negative multiples of, of Riemann integrable functions, I get another Riemann integrable function. So, the lighting conditions form a cone. I push that through this linear operator, I get a cone in the image space. And this has been known for a long time in computer vision. You know, this is kind of a, a fundamental object in talking about illumination invariance or building illumination invariant um, algorithms. Okay, so our set of interest is a convex cone. Now, this convex cone does contain some lighting conditions that are, you know, in some sense, unlikely to be encountered in practice. So as an example, this would include, for example, the situation where you know, I'm at the campfire, I take the flashlight and put it under my face, and I create you know, some very horrific image that's very difficult for us to process. So um, one thing that you can do is you can actually think about a collection of cones. So this C0 is the cone that I, I introduced on the last slide. This is the set of all images that you might encounter under variations in the lighting. Um, you can make a collection C alpha that's indexed by alpha, which is the fraction of ambient lighting. Okay, so geometrically, as alpha gets bigger, these things get more and more, point, more, and more pointy. So they collapse towards an ambient image. And so what we would hope is that um, if alpha is bigger, then it's easier to represent this object. Okay, but basically, if I, if I want to solve this problem, um, with you know, some notion that I'm doing the correct thing, then my problem is really one of, a, of approximating the set of images that I could encounter, so approximating this convex cone. And there are several ways that you might go about approximating a convex cone, but in some sense here, the natural one is really uh, V or vertex approximation. So, so here these vertices are just um, all non-negative multiples of a given image. And so it's, it's very natural. It says I approximate everything as the conic hull of just a few things. Okay, so we have a collection of convex cones and the representation that we're looking for is a vertex approximation. And so you can ask yourself, well, if I want to build this approximation, what notion of approximation do I need to think about? So what's the right way to measure how well I'm doing? And it turns out, you know, if you just think a little bit, um, it turns out that if you want to make a statement that says that my representation will accept any image that's sufficiently close to an image of me and will reject any image that's sufficiently far from an image of me, then the right notion of approximation is really one, of, one in Hausdorff's sense. So we would like to build an approximation in Hausdorff's sense to this, to this object. Um, now, I should say cones are homogeneous, so when we say Hausdorff sense, we really mean we intersect with the sphere. But this is what we would like to do. We would like to build an approximation in Hausdorff sense to the collection of images that I'm going to see. Okay, so uh, kind of the, the natural thing to do then is to look at the literature on approximation of convex cones. And there are a couple of literatures that, that deal with this question on, on various levels. Um, there's obviously work in geometry as well as in theoretical computer science. The kinds of statements that you can make for general cones in high dimensions are fairly pessimistic. 
And this is, you know, in some sense not surprising. If you have an object in very high dimensions, it's hard to, in general, it's hard to approximate it accurately. So if you think of examples like a, like a circular cone in high dimensions, you really need a very large number of, of extreme rays to approximate that with, with any reasonable accuracy. Okay, so another line of work that's relevant to this um, comes in the computer vision literature. So, you know, people like uh, Ravi Ramamurthy, who's done a lot of work using, using these kinds of models for, um, for computer graphics applications. Um, and the kinds of statements that you get in that literature deal a little bit more with the physics of, of the particular cone. So this is an, an example of, a, of the kind of result that you can claim. Um, what it says is if I think about very, very simple objects, so I think about the Lambertian sphere, for example, or other convex Lambertian objects. If I imagine that I have a single point source and it's oriented uniformly at random, then there exists a subspace of very low dimension that captures most of the energy of that collection of, of images. So if I imagine that I take the expectation over this uniformly oriented point source um, in expectation for the convex object, I do quite well. Okay, so that's, that's very motivating. That actually motivated a lot of the work that you saw at the, at the beginning of the talk. On the other hand, um, if we really want confidence in our representation, we have to worry a little bit here because the objects that we care about in practice are often not convex. Um, there's a very visual example of this. You know, you think about a person with a nose. It takes a, a, a fairly um, extreme act to, to turn that into a convex object. And this actually shows up when you think about the, the collection of images, you know, actually, cast shadows play a very large role in, um, in determining how easy or hard it is to approximate this collection of images. And so the basic upshot here is that um, if we want a very accurate representation, we're going to need to use some extra structure in the data. And so the special structure that I'll, I'll use um, is just a, actually a very simple fact. It's this observation that if we look at this cone, its extreme rays are actually what could be considered as images under point illumination. So I imagine that I have a point source, say, up there, it's illuminating me. And I think about the, the collection of all such images that I could generate. So, you know, my point source lives on a two-dimensional space. That's cutting out a low-dimensional sub-manifold of this high-dimensional image space. Now I've put sub-manifold in quotes here. It turns out that this map from the lighting direction to the image is continuous, but it's not Lipschitz um, due to the presence of, of edges. And so this is a sub-manifold in some sense, but it's, it's not a very nice one. Um, it's in some sense, non-differentiable. So uh, there are going to be some challenges for approximating this thing. But anyway, this is the, this is the basic structure that we have. And it's not too difficult to show that if you can well approximate these extreme rays, then you can well approximate the cone. Okay. And so the kind of result that you can obtain then if you do a little bit of analysis is you can say, well, if I sit down and I try to approximate this collection of extreme rays, how many examples am I actually going to need to be able to do this well? So you could define a kind of covering number for this set. And this is going to depend on properties of your object and properties of your imaging system. Um, in particular, it depends on a notion of convexity defect of the object. So that's what this, uh, this chi-star parameter here is capturing. So we have two terms here in the bound. Um, one is a smooth term that's coming from these smooth variations. That's sort of what would be well approximated by the convex Lambertian model. Um, and then we have a second non-smooth term that's really capturing the edges or the cache shadows. So if we put them together, then we can get bounds on the number of examples that we need to do well here. And so in particular, um, if your object is convex, then you can do well with about one over gamma squared examples, where gamma is your target Hausdorff distance. If your object is non-convex, then you need one over gamma to the four, which is you know, it's, it's polynomial in your target error, although it's not the friendliest polynomial in the world. It's 
But in any case, it's possible to say something. Uh, now, actually, this four comes from a fairly simple place. So there are two degrees of, two degrees of freedom in the, the placement of the light source. And then there's an extra factor of two here that's lost just because of non-smoothness due to the moving boundaries from edges. OK, so this is the kind of thing that you can say about the quality of the, the, quality of the representation. Now, this is very, very specific. This is probably a little bit too specific for the interests of most of the audience here. Um, actually, though, the, the technology that, that gives us this touches on things that I think are of interest to most of us. Um, so if you look at how you would go about trying to pr prove a result of this nature, the basic challenge is how, how you can capture or account for these cast shadows. So you know, how do you calculate the error that you incur? And it turns out that the, the proof uses a kind of interesting fact about this collection of images that you might encounter under varying illumination, this collection of extreme rays. And that fact is that this thing can be, for certain, um, for certain reflectance models, can be decomposed as something that's low dimensional, so is low rank, and something else that is spatially sparse. And so actually, there's another kind of nice property of the set of images that's really underlying all of this. So you know, in some sense, the structure is very intricate. We start out looking at a cone. Its extreme rays lie on a submanifold. Those extreme rays viewed as a matrix are low rank and sparse. So it can both decompose D into the, the L and the S. And this low, these kind of low rank and sparse models are actually of great interest computationally for you know, actually a lot of different problems. Um, problems in doing robust analysis of large data sets. So there, the sparsity would be the error. You know, here are the people in the, in the video. Um, problems in learning latent variable graphical models. And uh, you know, a lot of other things that have been, have been looked at that I think are, are of quite a bit of interest for this kind of big data phenomenon or big data community. Um, and you know, one of the reasons that these models are interesting is that they actually come with very good computational tools. So there's a, there's a very nice convex relaxation for taking a given matrix, so this is your input D, and decomposing it into the low rank and the sparse term. So this first appears in published work by Chandrasekharan, and they also have some very nice analysis of this, uh, this formulation. Um, there are a number of results in the literature that you know, basically quantify when this thing works well. This is a result with um, Emmanuel Kendas and Xiaodong Li. Um, what these results tell you roughly is that if you're in the kind of situation that we see here, you know, if you're in the situation where you have a physical model, and so there's really reason to believe this, this L plus S. And these L and S don't look too much like each other. So here, this L satisfies a technical incoherence condition. This S satisfies a Bernoulli model. Then you actually do get exact recovery here. OK. So you know, in some sense, we started out very, very specific, um, very application driven. But we got to a very general model, um, something that you know, has, has a lot of applications in different places. On the other hand, if you look at the chronology of this work, um, it, it took quite a while to get there. You know, if we go from the beginning of the talk to this result on quality of approximation, this is at least four years of sort of sweat and calculation and, you know, just mucking around with the problem. And, so, you know, in some sense, that's, that's, that's satisfying, but that, that's also, also very specific. And given the number of new types of data that we're seeing, you know, almost, almost on a daily basis and the number of new problems, it's reasonable to ask whether it's actually possible to bypass, to some extent, this process. So can we get away with learning the structural model without knowing as much about the physics of the situation? So, you know, is there, is there some way of bypassing, at least to some extent, this, uh, this, this kind of tedious process of analysis? And uh, of course, the answer is no if you want really strong statements. Um, 
But for a lot of practical applications, the answer seems to be yes. So there's really great interest um, in, in the engineering community in being able to take data and go from them to the concise, to the concise signal model. Um, one very simple instance of this is what's known as the dictionary learning problem. So in dictionary learning, I'm given a bunch of data instances. So here, these are going to be vectors y. These are living in an m-dimensional space once we start making some notation. And we imagine that these y collectively have a sparse representation in a certain dictionary A, which we don't know ahead of time. So I believe that I can write down y is equal to A times x, where y is the data, A is the dictionary, and x is sparse. And if I don't know A ahead of time, then my computational problem is really one of going from the data to the dictionary. So how can I obtain an estimate, you know, or maybe in some circumstances actually exactly recover this dictionary A? So this is a, a very, very simple problem to write down, but it's a very challenging problem to solve with any kind of a, with any kind of a, a, a very satisfying theory. Although there are good, there are good engineering, engineering approaches to this. So the problem is I'm given y, which is close to a times x. a is unknown, x is unknown, x is sparse. And I want to recover a and x. And so if you sit down and you look at this for a second, the first thing that you notice is that the solution is ambiguous here. So if I were to permute the columns of a, make the corresponding permutation to the rows of x, I get a solution that's just as good. And so there are, in some sense, a combinatorially large number of optimal solutions to this problem in any way that you would, you would think to, form, to formulate it. And so this is a very basic fact, but it turns out to capture most of what's hard about the problem. So we'll see this has very um, negative consequences or at least very challenging consequences for our ability to write down global formulations, simply because any kind of a, a convex, um, any kind of a convex relaxation of the problem is going to have to break the symmetry somehow. Okay, so there are ambiguities. And there's kind of an interesting geometry to the problem. So each of my columns is a sparse combination of the dictionary, the dictionary vectors. Um, what this means is that each of my data vectors actually lives on a particular union of, union of k-dimensional subspaces. So if I imagine each of these xj's is k-sparse, then if I take the collection of n choose k subspaces that are spanned by k set, sets of columns of A, my data should lie on this set. Now, you can turn this around. You can say, well, okay, let's suppose my data do lie on this set. Um, so say I've observed a very large number of points. Is this enough to make the problem well posed? You know, since this is in some sense the object that we're trying to fit. Um, and it turns out that the answer is, the answer is yes. Um, so this is a result due to Mickey Alad and collaborators. Um, what it says is if you take this very large arrangement of subspaces, you put at least k plus one uh, non-degenerate points on each of them, then you've, in some sense, identified this object. So there's, it's, it's possible to identify the factorization up to the inevitable ambiguity, so up to, the, up to this one. So, you know, that's, that's, that's great as starting to understand when the problem is well posed. Um, it's a little bit problematic if you want to work with reasonable data sizes, since this, this P is obviously combinatorially large. So this is, we're, we're here for big data, but this is, this is really very large data. This is k plus one n choose k. Um, so if this is all we know about the problem, we might reasonably ask whether, it's, whether we should even be thinking about this at all. You know, is this, is this simply too complicated of an object to fit? And so there are a couple of very nice results in machine learning that say that in some sense, no. Um, at least in the sense of, of generalization. So this is a result by uh, Manner and Bruckstein. Um, what it says is, if I find some good way to fit the dictionary to data, so if I find a way of getting, a, getting an A that works well on, on the data samples that I've seen, then I expect that I won't be fooling myself. So the expected error over new samples 
is not too much worse than what we see on the training data. And in particular, the uh, numerator here is just m times, times n. Here, the dictionary was m by n. So, you know, at first glance, it's actually not entirely obvious that this would be, that this would be true. You know, here we have a very, very complicated object. But it says that if we can find a good dictionary, then actually, actually we, should, we should do okay on new data. So in some sense, the problem might not be as bad as we thought. Okay, so armed with that intuition, we can go about thinking about ways of finding the dictionary. And there's a very, very popular approach, um, very successful approach in applications, which says I write down an energy function. It's capturing some quality of approximation on the data that I've seen. So this is this, this first term here. And also involves some kind of sparsity encouraging regularizer. So that's this J of X here. So I write down my, my energy function. And I observe that for most natural J, for example, if J is an L1 norm, um, this thing is convex in each of the terms when the other is fixed. And so the natural idea is to apply alternating directions. So I, I minimize over A, I minimize over X, and hopefully that takes me to a local optimum. And if you're careful about how you construct the algorithm, then it actually is possible to get convergence at least to a stationary point. So you're in some sense getting a local solution now, there's a tremendous amount of work on this. There are a lot of variants. Many of them have actually worked quite, quite well. Um, I'm not really going to go into too much detail talking about the various approaches to this, but most of them have the flavor of doing alternating directions over A and X. So we write down the energy function and we alternate. So if that can give us a local minimum, then there's a kind of natural question for analysis, which is, well, is my target solution a local minimum? So, you know, say I, I think about a, a simplified model of the problem. I imagine that I see y is a times x. x is sparse and satisfies a random model. So for example, the entries in x are products of independent Bernoulli random variables and independent Gaussian random variables, or more generally symmetric sub-Gaussian random variables. And under this probabilistic model, I study whether my, my solution of interest actually is a local minimum. And so it's possible to do, do analysis here. Um, it's possible to prove things. Um, there's a, a very nice result due to Remy Gruppenball and Karen Schnass that says that this is the case for square incoherent dictionaries A. And there are other results. For example, this is due to Cheng Gung and myself. Um, which say that for general overcomplete dictionaries, this is the case. And there, 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 are, there are a number of results of this nature. Um, Francis Bach also has work. Um, basically, what you can say is that if you, if you assume that the data follow an appropriate model, so if they actually are sparse and the coefficients are random, then provided I've seen enough examples, my target solution is a local minimum to a natural optimization problem. Now, you could rightfully ask yourself whether this is in some sense obvious. You know, we, we, we said that we're locally minimizing a sparsity surrogate, and now you've proved that it's a local optimum. And, you know, maybe it is. I mean, I mean maybe it's, it's, it's very expected. Um, it's not entirely trivial to analyze. So it turns out that there are some difficulties for analysis here um, that come from the fact that when I linearize this problem, the linearized subproblem that I have to look at actually doesn't satisfy some of the most popular conditions for guaranteeing, um, guaranteeing L1 recovery. So for example, you run into problems that don't have restricted isometry, don't have incoherence, and so you need other ideas. So the ideas that are useful here are ones that work in problems where you don't have restricted isometry, such as the matrix completion problem. Okay. But in any case, you, you use these tools and you can prove that your solution of interest is a local minimum. So that's satisfying to an extent, um, but there's still a gap because we've proved that the solution is a local minimum and we know that the algorithm gives us back a local minimum, but we don't know that they're the same local minimum. So we haven't really yet done a performance analysis of the algorithm. 
And so the natural question to ask is whether it's possible to obtain in some situations some kind of global result. And as far as we know, we know no way of doing this in general right now. So in general, the problem is very hard. Um, most of the difficulties seem to come from the sign permutation ambiguity. It's the fact that there's symmetry in the problem. But there is one very special case where it actually is possible to say something. Um, and that special case is when our target dictionary A is actually a square matrix, and that matrix is non-singular. So if we imagine that A is M by M, non-singular matrix, then we can actually turn the geometry of the problem around a little bit. So instead of thinking about this complicated collection of columns, we can actually think about the rows. Okay, so if A is non-singular, then clearly the row space of Y is the same as the row space of X. And so instead of trying to fit a large collection of subspaces to these data vectors, I can imagine that I, that I should try to find these sparse rows within the row space of Y. So I look for sparse vectors in a known subspace. And so the, the good thing here, of course, is that this row space of Y is something that I know ahead of time. And again, this is a really a special property of the, of the complete case, really a special fact, special property of A being non-singular. Okay, and so if I take the same random model as before, I imagine that the coefficients are Bernoulli Gaussian or Bernoulli sub-Gaussian random variables, then I really don't need to see too many examples for this problem to become well-posed. So I would say that the problem is well-posed once these rows of X are the sparsest vectors in this known subspace. And so, uh, you know, you do a little bit of calculation and you need about n log n examples for that to happen under this random model. So if I compare, um, in the complete case, I end up with uniqueness from about n log n random observations. In the overcomplete case, if I were to think about it in the same geometry, then instead of looking for sparse vectors in the subspace that I know, I would be looking for sparse vectors that live in some extension of this subspace. Right, so here I see the row space of Y in the overcomplete case. This is a lower dimensional subspace. My sparse vectors, my rows of X, would live in some higher dimensional subspace that contains it. And so, you know, in some sense, it's clear that finding this higher dimensional subspace is a, is a more challenging problem. Okay, so this um, complete case is very good for uniqueness analysis. What are the implications for algorithms? So can we use this property to get a global algorithm? Okay, well, the natural approach to this would be to start with a combinatorial formulation of the problem. I'm looking for a sparse vector in the row space of Y, and I would like that not to be the zero vector. So I'm looking for some linear combination of the rows of Y that is sparse and is not the trivial linear combination. So there are two parts that are, that are challenging here. Um, this is a non-convex objective function. This is a non-convex constraint. For the objective function, it's fairly clear what to do. We, at least as a first thing to try, we take this L0 norm, we replace it with the L1 norm, and we minimize that. So the question is really what to do with this constraint that says that I, I don't look for the zero vector. And so one thing that you can try to give a convex way of enforcing this is just to ask my W, the thing that's making my linear combination here, to live on some affine hyperplane. So I ask that R transpose W is equal to one. Now, the question is, what affine hyperplane? You know, I could, I could consider a lot of them. Um, one possibility would be to simply choose R at random. And that actually works if the problem is very, very sparse. So if you have about, um, square root of log n non-zeros in each column, then, then even a random choice works here. But for denser scenarios, there's actually a better choice. And to think about this uh, better choice of R, this better way of breaking the symmetry here, preferring a single row, um, it's useful to make a change of variables. So what we would like is we would like that when I multiply the solution w hat to this one through y, I get one of the rows of X, maybe up to scale. 
If I can guarantee to do that once, then I repeat it n times, I get, get each of the rows of x, and I'll be in good shape. So let's change variables. Let's let q be a transpose times w. And let's imagine, just for the sake of analysis, that I'm instead minimizing q transpose x, so just make the substitution here, subject to a inverse r transpose q is equal to 1. Well, what you can see is, if we could make this a inverse r be the ith standard basis vector, then this constraint would very strongly encourage the solution q to pick out the ith row. And in fact, you can prove that if the problem is sparse enough and the random model holds, then, then that will happen with high probability. Now, unfortunately, to be able to choose that directly, we would have to use A. And we don't know A. You know, our, our goal is to learn the dictionary. Um, we certainly don't have A ahead of time. What we do have are superpositions of just a few of the elements of A. So we have access to the data Y. And I've assumed that each of these yj's is a sparse linear combination of the columns of A. And so as a, a reasonable substitute here, I might imagine just using yj as my vector r. So I take the, the, jth, the jth dictionary, excuse me, the jth, um, the jth observation, I solve this problem, and I imagine repeating this for many j. OK, so this is what the, uh, the algorithm would look like. You would have a first step where you solve a sequence of L1 minimization problems. Um, each of these gives me a vector in the row space of Y. And uh, what I'll do is I'll just find a bunch of those vectors. And then I'll have a second greedy procedure that just goes and picks out the sparsest linear independent set from this collection of vectors. OK, so we just repeatedly take the sparsest one um, until, until we've found n of them or you know, we've exhausted our, our collection of, of, ex of examples yj. So I solve the sequence of, of L1 minimization problems, and then I use a greedy algorithm to do the reconstruction. OK, and there are variants that you can make, so for example, um, it turns out, for technical reasons, that sometimes it's actually better to do this with combinations of a few of the columns of Y. Um, this allows you to get a result that is, in some sense, less specific to the distribution that we've assumed. Um, so in particular, this choice of a sum of two columns works for um, both Bernoulli-Gaussian, Bernoulli-Rademacher, actually general Bernoulli-Sub-Gaussian models. Whereas for the, the, the first one, we actually need a Gaussian model. Okay, but that's, in some sense, um, at least to me, that's, that's kind of a technicality here. Um, the important idea is really that we're looking for the, these rows of x as sparse vectors in this known subspace, the row space of y. And the data vectors themselves, these yj's, really give us a way of breaking the symmetry. So basically, we have n potential solutions here, n rows of x, and and what the data vectors are doing is they're, they're really helping us to choose solutions that have the same support. So, you know, symmetry is a big challenge for convex relaxations. This allows us to get, to get past it um, in some sense here. Okay, and so the kind of mathematical result that you can prove about this algorithm is, you know, again, similar in spirit to what I showed you before, although perhaps there are more uh, technical restrictions. So the spirit of the result is that if the model holds and the problem is nice enough, then the relaxation works with very high probability. So in particular, if you take your coefficients from a Bernoulli sub-Gaussian model and you've seen enough samples, and here, you know, what we prove in the paper is about, is that you need about n squared log squared n then as long as the problem is sparse enough, this, um, this algorithm is actually going to recover with high probability all of the rows of x. And so that would allow you then to subsequently recover the dictionary. OK. So that's what you can prove. Now it's worth commenting on this sparsity level. So this theta is the parameter in the Bernoulli model. 
So we said that each of the elements of x is non-zero with probability theta. So what this sparsity level is saying is, you know, if I have n dictionary atoms, then I'm going to have at most about square root of n non-zeros per column. So if you think about the, the sparsity level that we can do here, this is about on the same order as what you might be able to get in some of the classical results in, in sparse approximation when the dictionary is known and incoherent. So it gets us, gets us up to about this square root of n non-zeros per column. Now, it's worth saying that you can also prove that the algorithm breaks down, at least in this form, when the number of non-zeros is significantly beyond square root of n. So there may be some kind of a transition here at square root of n. But at least what it says is, for a specific instance of this dictionary learning problem, it's possible to have an algorithm that you know, works uh, globally, just solves a sequence of convex programs, and gives a recovery guarantee. And this is actually something that you see in simulation. So if you, if you simulate the algorithm, um, here I'm showing varying dictionary size, varying number of non-zeros. Then what you'll see is that the algorithm that I described to you, this uh, A here, has a, a very nice property, which is that when the data satisfy the model, um, if the data are nice enough, the algorithm succeeds with very high probability. That's what white means here. If not, then the algorithm fails with very high probability. And similarly, so the second one here that actually gets a little bit, has a little bit better breakdown point empirically is a, a variant that orthogonalizes after each vector that we find. So you can, you can make variants that actually have better practical performance. But this is kind of a nice property. And this is a property that we don't see as much in um, algorithms that weren't designed with this specific goal in mind. So, you know, things like the, the KSVD or the online learning work very scalably, um, but they don't, they don't seem to have this very nice exact recovery phenomenon, at least in, in these experiments. Okay, so we kind of cover a lot of ground so far in the talk. Um, I guess the, the, the big picture here is we're really looking for representations for, for visual data that suffice for tasks. So in particular, suffice for things like recognition or for things like compact representation, you know, maybe compression, denoising. Um, each of the methodologies that, that I know for getting, getting these kinds of results suffers from challenges. Um, in particular, if we think about the analytical me methodology, then we need to think very carefully about very specific problems, although it's possible to do this in some cases. Um, if we think about the, the computational methodology, then we can really embrace a lot of applications, although there are some very hard mathematical challenges in how we can understand performance of algorithms or how we can get global algorithms for, um, for solving these kind of recovery or approximation problems. Okay, and obviously there are some very nice problems for open, open work here in, in both directions. Um, in particular, in this dictionary learning problem, um, until very recently there was absolutely nothing on the overcomplete case, at least in terms of global performance guarantees. Still, there's a lot to be done there. Um, there's not much in terms of, of noise-free results. And the sparsity that we can do is fairly limited. So we have this, this root end barrier. So there's really still a lot to understand here, but you know, at, at least in both of these directions, we, we start to see a little bit of an avenue. Okay, so I'd like to close by um, thanking my collaborators. So this, uh, the low rank and sparse is joint with Emmanuel and with uh, Yima. Um, the dictionary learning is joint with Dan Spielman and Huan Wang. And the computer vision applications are joint with some of my students. And so with that, I will thank you for, for your attention and welcome any questions. So questions. So I actually have a question. So uh, I actually have two questions. Sure. Big one. Okay, sure. Uh, so uh, first, does uh, Assuming that the that the, a, the dictionary matrix itself is positive or sparse or something like that, does that help at all? 
Uh, and B, uh, have you looked at cases where, or situations where you assume you don't actually get the dot product, but but a noisy version of that? So the so the data is not noisy, but you get noisy measurements of it. Some, so you, if you think about like like LDA kind of models, right. or text classification kind of models, they're actually very similar, right? But they have some inherent noise. In them. Right. Okay. Good. So so two questions. So the first one is. Um, how do you put additional assumptions on the dictionary here? And the answer to that is I really don't know how to, actually. Um, and the challenge is that, in some sense, you're working through the inverse of the dictionary matrix, right? You're working through this, this W, which is reaching in and picking out the rows of X. And so um, I actually don't know how to penalize W such that it would correspond to a non-negative A. Um, right? What you would like to do is you would like to say, these rows of W are coming from the inverse of an A, which is not negative. And I don't know how to pose that constraint in a, in a clean, computationally tractable way. Um, I would really like to be able to do that, because that's often the case, but I, I don't know how to do it. Um, the second question I think I didn't quite understand. So the second question you say, what if the data are clean, there's no noise in the data, but the inner products are noisy? Which inner products are you referring to? So, so your Maybe we should take it offline. It might be, it might be a long question. So. Okay. Uh, okay. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.